Hello, and welcome to Top Priorities to Stay Competitive in 2023. I'm your host, Tom Bullock, the Chief Storyteller here at Scrum Inc., and thanks for joining us. Unpredictable. We're just two months into 2023, yet that single word, unpredictable, may be the best way to describe this year's economic and market conditions. Concerns about inflation, a possible recession, supply chain disruptions, and a historically tight job market are just some of the economic headwinds organizations face. However, there are ways to turn unknowns into opportunities, and history shows us that this will be a banner year for those who seize on those opportunities. The question is how? Well, that's why our panel is here today to answer that specific question, and I'd love to introduce you to them now. First up, Robert Woods is a scrumming pr principal consultant specializing in pragmatic and practical applications to company-wide agility. Hey, Bobby. Good to be here. Thanks, Tom. Joyce Thompson is the director of AR and PR at Digital AI. She is also the lead for the State of Agile project, which produces the State of Agile report, the longest continuous annual series of reviews of agile techniques and practices. And as such, Joyce keeps a very close eye on Agile on the Agile market to help identify trends and provide insights. Joyce, thanks for bringing those insights here today. Oh, glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Tom. And finally, JJ Sutherland is a best-selling author, expert in enterprise agility, and the CEO of Scrum Inc. And he helps organizations around the globe accelerate value delivery, reduce waste, and increase profits. Hey, JJ. Hey, Tom. So I'm actually going to start with you, JJ. In the past, unpredictable economic times have led to a growth in agile implementations or adoption. Yet earlier this year, Capital One made a lot of news by firing 1,100 agilists, and they're not alone. I know you regularly speak with business leaders from all kinds of different companies around the globe. Why are some companies decreasing their agile workforce, in your opinion? Well, I think, uh, I'm not sure if it has to do with whether they're going to keep on doing agility or not. I think that Capital One has said that they will be doing that. But I think that it's really, are the Agilist Scrum Masters in this case, uh, are they showing that they produce value? Because think about it, one of our uh, customers has about 3,000 Scrum Masters. We just say each one costs 100 grand a year. That's $300 million. And that's a lot of money to anybody, any corporation, that's a huge amount of money. And if those scrum masters, those agile coaches are not showing that they actually deliver value to the business objectives, if I was a leader, I'd look be good looking at that like, that's a lot of money. We are you know, looking at tough financial times. That's where I would start looking to cut myself. And so I think one of the issues is that a lot of agilists don't actually make their work visible to leadership and management. They don't make their impact visible. And that can be really important, especially in these kind of times. And so there are ways to do it, but I think that agilists need to make sure that they aren't reporting out just agile metrics. What's your velocity, you know, you know, continuous improvement, Kaizen's. It needs to be, how do those metrics actually impact business goals? Because if you cannot align with the business goals, you're not producing value. And you need to make that visible, which is very possible to do. I know of uh, one large defense contractor where where every uh, you know contract they bid on, they had to show why you're spending money on con on scrum masters would actually improve outcomes, faster, higher quality, and, and you know delivering these outcomes, financial outcomes. And in tough times like this, if you cannot show that, you're going to be you lose your job. So, JJ, it sounds like what you're saying is Agile is here to stay. Companies, in fact, you're you're absolutely right about, about Capital One. They said one of the reasons that they gave for the job cuts is they, they feel that they are a mature Agile company, and therefore the responsibility, the accountability of the Scrum Masters in particular could be absorbed by other members of the Agile team. But this is really about making sure that you are aligned with business objectives clearly and delivering on, showing how you help deliver on those business objectives. Is that a fair way to sum that up? Absolutely. And if you are just a scrum master who's, you know, making sure events happen and there's a lot of sticky notes and you focus on, you know, is the team happy? All those things are good things. 
But if you don't focus on business outcomes, you're going to be in trouble because that's the whole point of a scrum master is turning a backlog into value. And if you're not helping your team do that, you shouldn't have the job anyway. So business outcomes, keeping everything aligned on business outcomes is clearly one of the top priorities to stay competitive here. Bobby, I know you focus in on really pragmatic um, and pragmatic approaches when it comes to rolling out Agile in an organization. Any advice that you have in terms of how Agilists, regardless of whether it's a product owner, a scrum master, a team member, a developer, uh, a coach, how they can make sure they show that they are aligned to those business objectives? Yeah, Tom, transparency is their favorite tool to be able to use in those in those circumstances. When you see situations where scrum masters, I, I have a 20 year old son who's a scrum master in a large in a global insurance company, and he's running into the exact same thing JJ was just talking about. And part of it's the culture internally, kind of holding scrum masters at arm length to say, no, nah, you're, you're a meeting facilitator and then just kind of stay in your lane. But providing transparency to where you're aligning your team with business outcomes and being able to do that in a way that means something to the people who need that information really goes a long way to show that your role is critical to helping those teams get to where they need to go from a business perspective, not just in terms of facilitating team events. And Joyce, um, I'm going to just say it, big fan of the 16th Annual State of Agile Report. Um, really good insights in there. And one thing is aligning to these objectives, business objectives, that is that is a, a thread that is woven throughout the most recent State of Agile Report, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, it really is. We, we found that when we asked people what they were being measured on, 47% said they're measured on on-time delivery, which is something we would expect, right? To, to meet the business, you need to be on time. But 44% said they're measured by business objectives achieved. And when we dug a little bit deeper into that, 54% said it's to prioritize by company goals. And yet when we asked people what types of metrics they were using to measure business value, 19%, that is nearly one in five respondents did not know. Hmm. They didn't know. Wow. And one so thing, Tom, is that at Capital One, I did you know look into this, is that they're still hiring product owners. That the product owners are still valuable, seen as valuable in prioritizing and delivering that value. And, and just from the research that I've seen, and some of it you shared with me, JJ, thank you, is this is not at all, this shouldn't be seen at all as a knock on scrum masters. It is an incredibly important role. It's just some scrum masters may not be showing their business value clearly enough and aligning it clearly enough. So this is a situation we've all seen. Leadership may not be active in the agile space, you know, the network in their organization. So they may not understand it. And the point is to help them understand it by tying it to something they do understand. You know, Tom, it's kind of ironic because for a long time we were coaching scrum masters and, hey, be humble. It's all about the team. Stand up the team to, to show that they're so, so great at the things that they're doing. And if you're doing that well as a scrum master, even as an agile coach, to show that teams are becoming empowered and they're getting really good at embracing their process and so forth, then it almost starts to diminish in other people the, the role that you have as a scrum master and agile coach. That's why the transparency into how you're aligning and where you're helping in those areas becomes really, really important. And there's very specific techniques and ways to be able to do that. We can't go through them all right here, but it's important for people to have that skill set under their belt so they can see where value is being provided. My last question for this first topic, which is aligning to business outcomes in a clear, transparent way, is specific to the Scrum Masters out there or those who are interested in this. And I would like us to go a little bit deeper if we can. And I'm curious, much of Scrum Mastery is obviously process focused. How can we, how can organizations, not just Scrum Masters, how can organizations shift from a process focused approach to an approach that's outcome focused in terms of their work? And this is just for anyone. You know, it, it's, it's interesting because the process, I'm actually right now, you know, rewriting the, you know, Scrum, the art of doing twice the work in half the time and go, I just finished going through chapter six, but it's the process is to deliver business outcomes. The process is not the goal in and of itself. 
I always tell people, if you're getting the business outcomes that you want and you're not agile, don't do a transformation. They're hard, you know, but getting those outcomes is what to do. And when a scrum master or an agile organization focuses too much on the process and doesn't make it clear, as Bobby was saying, that it's transparent how that process is feeding business results. Because when I talk to business leaders, you know, they like the ideas of agile. They like getting more stuff faster. They like being more nimble. They like that. But if they're not getting those business outcomes, they're saying that process doesn't deliver what it pro promises. Right. So I'd like to it's, move on to, oh, I'm sorry, Joyce, please. No, I, I was going to say, it wasn't, wasn't it Eisenhower who said, you know, the, the plan is nothing, planning is everything. And it's sort of the process itself. Let's not get excited about the process. You know, we can build the most fabulous process in the world that delivers absolutely nonsense results. So let, let's think about the process of the process, if you will, right? What, why are we doing? Why are we doing what we're doing? And not just what are we doing? Yeah, to what? And end. real quickly, Tom, that is like one of the key problems that some have found with the scrum masters and agile coaches. They became so focused in the process. And we talk about it all the time, not becoming overly scrummy with the things that they're doing and not focused on the outcomes that are actually taking place. And that too is tied into some of the things that we've seen. Sure. So let's move on to the next unpredictable, and this has really been unpredictable topic that we're going to uh, try to turn into an opportunity for everybody in the audience here today. And that's the possibility of a recession. And this has been fascinating to watch because by some measures, the United States at least is already in a recession, but in, by other measures, it's absolutely not. And the idea of recession proofing your organization or an organization is incredibly important when you just don't know. So I'm going to ask a big picture question here. And I invite anyone to answer. And the question is this, what are some of the key factors that distinguish organizations that are able to thrive in a recession from those that struggle or outright fail? I know it's a tricky question. Bobby, let's start with you. Any ideas? <laughs> Sure. So I, I think it's fascinating because we kind of saw this play out a little bit, not from a recession standpoint, from but from an adaptability standpoint, mm -hmm. when we saw people go from 2019 into 2020, right? Everybody had their one, three, five year long plans going into 2019 to 2020 and had to completely course correct and shift based on those changes. A recession is not too different in the sense that you've got to construct and build yourself in such a way that you can adapt to the things that are taking place. A recession is not going to last forever. And so we see some of the organizations that have done the best coming out of a recession actually did some self-investment. Part of that self-investment is constructing themselves in a way that they can adapt quickly to what's taking place as they come out of a recession. So being able to do that now will prep you better long-term. Mm -hmm. It really is. I mean, a lot of companies try to cut their way out of a recession, but in doing so, they end up in a dangerous spot because of de de decreased capacity. I mean, sometimes, you know, an organization is too large, it needs to be trimmed down. But a lot of times it's it's that classic haircut mentality when you end up hurting yourself more than positioning yourself to take advantage of an opportunity that comes up. JJ, I know this is something that you talk to lots of leaders about and the, I won't steal your thunder. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think... What a recession does is it focuses the mind. And that's what you want to take advantage of during a recession because it really makes you like, what is our core proposition? What is our unfair advantage? How can we deliver on that? And sometimes it's like, wow, we overinvested into something that is really not our core competency and we should not do that. I think some companies are doing that. But as Bobby said, if you just do, okay, everyone needs to cut 10% out of their business unit, then you're just sort of, getting your, you know, your ability to deliver is diminished. So it's focusing on what you need to do. And sometimes that does involve, you know, getting rid of uh, units that aren't, you know, aligned there. But it's also really interesting because in good times, in boom times, it's really like, hey, we're making, you know, a huge amount of profit. We're doing this. And it can be, a, you know, a time where you aren't focused because it's easy not to be focused. And that's one of the things that we're hoping Agile does is focus on those business outcomes and really focus the whole organization. That's the point. And, but in a recession, in some ways, it's actually easier 
because you have a burning platform issue. And as Bobby said, you can't cut your way out. You have to be able to focus and deliver value more quickly because if you cut too much, you're not going to be able to come out the other side because recessions do end. And Joyce, you and I were talking about this yesterday. Yeah, very, very much so. Um, you know, you think about it, there's this CapEx versus OpEx game and, and nobody goes and cuts their CapEx costs because that, that doesn't give you what you want. And unfortunately, staff are seen as, as OpEx instead of CapEx. Like we don't, there's a lot of talk ever since 2020 of, of the value of people, right? And it's been so refreshing to see this. LinkedIn feeds are full of HR people trying to hire, talking about the value of people. And then a recession comes in and all of a sudden the people are suddenly more of objects and we have to cut them. And I think the really interesting ways of doing this are how do we start to value our people as an asset as great as any other asset we have in the company, especially for services where people is, are entirely our asset, right? Or, or some kind of thought leadership. How do we work with them? And so we've seen case studies of companies who have put their their employees to other uses. Um, there was an electronics company that that had a lot of their marketing and sales team doing doing work for the community and sort of not doing company work, but still paying them, right? How are there creative ways? What are agile ways that we can pivot, right? Rather than what I call the same old, same old, um, which is which is what JJ and Bobby have really been touching upon, right? What what are ways that we can work with the the resources we have? And of course, I'll, I'll, that's a question for senior management, right? That's a question, um, and finance departments generally are discouraged from being creative. So that's a challenge. So just I would say one of the dangers of you know cutting too much because you're not just going to lose the people you want to get rid of. Yes. You're going to lose some of your best people. And that's a huge danger because if there's a lot of layoffs, some of the some of the people who have options, some of the people who can walk out the door and go to your competitor, will do that. Yeah, you'll you'll lay some people off, and other people will 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 want to leave because that that's that's a scary environment. And then all economic cycles, they're cycles; they end. There's something next, and. Are you just focusing on the scary thing in front of you? Or are you thinking, are you confident enough in your company that you know there's going to be a future stage? And are you setting yourself up so that you have the right people in place to be able to do that? Right. Right. And the, you know, the the title of this webinar is how to remain competitive throughout the year. To JJ and Joyce's points, if we're doing this. You see some organizations do this in, in the name of lean, right? Or we're going to become more lean and we're just going to wind up cutting all these areas, but we're not remaining competitive. We have to be able to construct ourselves in a way that as things start to improve, which they will, we see those the markets do that, like Joyce had mentioned, we've, we're competitive coming out. We're not just, we didn't just survive. We're able to outpace the other people that are in our market. And you, you just can't do that by allowing your best people to go, having that attrition take place, or just doing too many big cuts. There's some really interesting research um, that came out of, uh, that Bain did right after the, you know, the financial crisis, as we emerged from that in 2012, 2013. And the companies that were able, that hadn't slashed too much, they were able to take advantage of that as the uh, economy rebounded. And so that's what you, as Joyce has been pointing out, it will end. How do you take advantage when it does end? And some of your competitors might have, you know, slashed two months and it's going to take them a year to rebuild their uh, infrastructure, rebuild the people that can do it. Right. And what's fascinating to me is this is not the only way to recession proof a company. You also have to do some things like, you know, reduce risk. You have to, as JJ pointed out, as everybody's actually on the panel pointed out, you have to really focus in on core competencies, make sure that you're, you're putting, it's like, it's like a, a human body when you're out in the cold, your arms and feet get cold first because they're not critical to survival. Businesses are doing that same thing. The blood in your arms when you're cold goes back to your torso. That is actually a recession proof strategy in a way. How, how would you, let's do a hypothetical. What would you say to leadership? Because leadership is often something that's pointed to. I mean, Joyce, again, the difference between 
an agile network and leadership is all throughout your report. Um, how do you express this to leadership in a way that gets them to pay attention instead of just saying, well, everyone else is doing a 10% cut. I'm going to do one too. Send them links to webinars like this one and suggest they watch it. <laughs> well, I, I, the, the, the first thing is when you talk to leadership is money's real, mm -hmm. right? And that is very true. And that's going to be on their minds. Uh, if you're a public company, a private company, even in government, money is real. And so the, you have to figure out what are the constraints. And then a lot of it is focus. Because one of the things that Agile does is focus on prioritization from the top of the organization down to the teams who are delivering on the work. And getting, making sure that that is incredibly clear, that the organization priorities, that you're measuring the right things, you need to be able to do that. And that's where I encourage leaders to focus. Because I guarantee you there's a lot of teams in a large organization that are doing things that aren't aligned. It's not that they're bad teams. It's not that they're you know not really smart and have good skills. It's that they aren't aligned with leadership priorities. And I think that that really needs to go where it belongs, which is on the leadership being very clear. This is where we're headed. This is what we're doing. And even more importantly, this is what we're not doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tom, this is and what we call in the South, sharpening your saw while you're waiting for the trees to grow. Right. right? Well, <laughs> once they get there, you got to have a way to be able to do the work. And you want to do it in a very concise and sharp way. And so to JJ's point, uh, we got to know exactly where we're headed and be able to adapt when we see the needs to change. And so what are we measuring? What do we consider important? And then from a priorities perspective, we actually see a lot of organizations right now asking for help with their highest level prioritization so they can do exactly this. They can course correct when they see the need to do that. That is one way we can sharpen our saw so that we can go after those trees when they're ready. And, and as, as agilists who aren't necessarily in the leadership, then you know, how do we communicate with the leadership? Perhaps the best way is rather than, you know, I somewhat facetiously said, watch this webinar, but perhaps more important than telling them something is asking questions and asking questions that stimulate conversation. So what JJ and Bobby have been saying a lot here is, um, do you know what the priorities are? Do you know what the value is? What we're talking about is resiliency, right? And, and mm -hmm. so the resiliency of Wall Street is a well-known thing. And unfortunately, we fall into bad familiar habits. The resiliency of the pandemic was completely new. And so everybody sort of flailed about. But the point is, things are going to change, right? Um, weather is going to become more of an issue, right? Um, as we, we grow globally, the interactions of different cultures and expectations is going to increase. So there's always going to be something that's external, that's going to set the business off. And so the question then becomes the question, be become somebody who asks questions, but in but in a spirit of openness and curiosity and not in a spirit, no matter how cynical or worried you are, you need to approach it with an openness and curiosity. Are these still, some things have happened. Are these still the priorities? Has anything changed? Do we have new information? Is there something that we should do to shift, right? It's, it's as employees asking those questions to leaders, because then leaders can feel free to ask those questions of each other and can spark conversation, right? That's a great point, Joyce. And it, what it really reminds me of is uh, the supply chain disruptions of 2020 and 2021 where suddenly everyone had to shift their focus because we're so used to a global, uninterrupted global supply chain. And between the pandemic and giant container ships in the Suez, we saw exactly what could happen with a small disruption cascades into a larger one. But the question here, perhaps this is for this section, this might be part of the tip, is to be resilient. You need to approach 2023 and the, the possibility of a recession not as a recession, so there's you know a classic playbook, but you have to treat it like a, a pop-up problem and, and look for those quick feedback loops to solve that issue the same way many organizations had to try to figure out how to rebuild their supply chains. Is that is that a fair way to say it? I yes, I think that's great. All right. <laughs> Good job, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. <laughs> As Southerners have to stick together. Right. Um, let's move on to the next one now, which is inflation. 
There is no doubt that inflation is here. There is no doubt that it is having a direct impact on organizations, no matter what they do, and consumers, no matter what they're buying. So if I was an organization coming to each of you, I'm curious, how do you balance, how does an organization balance the need to maintain profitability, especially given the other economic headwinds we've been talking about, with the need to keep prices competitive in an environment like this? JJ, I'll start with you. Sure. Um, I was talking to a CEO the other day who, uh, what they do is they make like the racks that go into Amazon warehouses and stuff like that. So a lot of their cost is metal. And he says, oh, it's really easy because it's just benchmarked to the cost of steel. And he says, you know, we're going to, you know, raise our prices and, and pass those costs along. So if you have that situation, it's really great to put into your contracts as, you know, whatever measurable thing goes up, they cap it at like 5% a year or something like that. But as it goes up, our prices go up, not because we're raising prices, just, you know, the cost of the raw materials. It's just there and we can measure it and we just tag it to that. Um, the other thing is really sort of showing the value that you're delivering. Again, it's this transparency of the value. And with inflation, there's some things you're going to have to eat right? Mm -hmm. there, there are some things you're just going to have to eat. But that means you need to figure out how are you going to work that into your margins? How are you? You're probably going to have to accept a little bit of a lower margin because also your people are going to want to get paid a little bit more, right? Because they're the ones out there buying eggs and beef and all the things that are going up in price at the supermarket. That's saw the cost of eggs the other day. I was buying some at Costco. And they a lot were of pasta, know, JJ. A lot of pasta. A lot of pasta. <laughs> but, <laughs> What it is, it's sort of, again, it's like, okay, the market has changed. We have to figure this out. So how can we react either by saying we need to, you know, you know, peg some things to inflation, you know, if possible, not all contracts can do that. Or it's saying, okay, we're going to have to accept this and it's going to eat into our margin. So how do we do things more efficiently? How do we cut some of our cost out by delivering more? Because that that's really almost the easy, because that's within your locus of control. You can actually do that in an agile organization. You can see how are we delivering? What's the cost of delivery? Can we deliver more, more efficiently? Right. And that's something that I think what Scrum Masters and Agile coaches, that's a metric that I would be looking at is how do we deliver the same value more efficiently with the teams we have? And that's something where Agile can really show because it's, really getting it done quickly and to quality. And I think that's what Agile can do. That's what a lot of our customers are coming to us for. You know, Tom, what, what this comes down to over and over again is the value question, right? Mm -hmm. What is the real value of my company? You know, companies will have their core value and then they have ancillary or, or other things. Um, sometimes that other thing becomes more valuable than the original core product. So you pivot towards that, right? Sure. Sometimes you double down on your core value. So again, you need to know what is value to not only your company and your leadership, but to customers. There has to be that connection to where are customers having value? Because if I'm a customer, you know, I have a I have a budget just personally, and there are certain things I will not touch. The price is going to go up. The price is fairly, you know, elastic. I'll I'll take a certain amount of hit because I won't let go of something. You know, medications are like that. People will, will need their medications, and then there are other things that I'll let go because well, that was fun. But in a, you know, when my budget's tightened, I'm gonna that's the first thing to go right. And our customers are looking at that. They're looking at our services and our our value. Um, when they buy our companies or our organizations, products and services. So again, the, the point is we can't get comfortable. No, the answers aren't fixed. The value mm -hmm. isn't fixed. You know, what works today may not work tomorrow. And it's that, that agility, that flexibility that we need to lean into, but always keeping the eye on what is the value right now? Well, you know, the Tom, customer another... is the key point here. I, I'm sorry, Bobby, I'll be happy to go to you in a second yeah. because the trick with inflation, and this is this goes to both Joyce, your comment and JJ's comment, it's if, if it's eating into your margins for the business, it's because they're not passing it on to the customer. If the customer is being asked to take on more cost, that is directly being passed on to the customer. And at some point, customer satisfaction and that value proposition is critically important and endangered. It's a teeter-totter here. You have to find out that balance. 
And I, I, again, through the most recent State of Agile survey, that customer satisfaction metric, that core idea of Agile, that feedback loop that we all live on, this is not a new tip, but it is absolutely critical in 2023 that you have to find that balance. Otherwise, you're either going to lose margins or lose customers or both. Now, Bobby, I interrupted you, so please. Oh, yeah, no no problem. I think I interrupted you. But uh, something also that can be somewhat overlooked at times when it comes to things like inflation is we're part of a larger ecosystem as an organization. You know, we have people who we partner with, vendors who we work with, third parties, people who we rely on. And so strategically, who we go about partnering with can sometimes determine and often will determine what our costs wind up being, and then working together as a group that's trying to be more agile in a time of uh, recession or inflation uh, will impact one another. And so when we're looking for people who to partner with, their ability to be as adaptive as we're trying to be will play a large role in our overall success as a part of that ecosystem. So the final area I want to cover before we get to the questions, and again, if you do have questions, please click that Q&A button. Uh, there's some great questions that we're seeing in the chat, so please keep them coming. We appreciate it. Um, this is one of the strangest things about the current economic condition, that unpredictability that's defining this year, which is at the same time that we're talking about layoffs, there is a huge war for talent. That war for talent is absolutely hindering some organizations. We all know that getting like JJ, you say this about about our people here at Scrum Inc. all the time. They are our they are our competitive advantage. They are our secret, you know, edge against everybody else, and it's not so secret. But trying to lure, trying to win the war for talent in a situation like this is incredibly complicated. So I want to talk about the whole concept of culture here and, the, and how it plays in to the war for talent. Um, Joyce, let's start with you. The State of Agile report showed a huge growth in human resources uh, programs or departments uh, adopting Agile practices, huge growth. It, do you think in the information, the data that you've gone through, that that is starting to show that, that organizations are more understanding of the need of a positive culture or more embracing an agile culture, or is it just, it's finally spread to that? It, well, it's, it's a little bit of both and it's industry by industry, right? There are some, some industries where you could kind of see it where it's still called HR versus where it's called people, sure. right? That's, you know, and, and, and some of that is fashion. Um, the, the, Concern I have is that Agile is a fashionable thing for some people that they'll put on and wear and they won't necessarily take it in and, and use it all, but they'll just slap a label on it and do some things that look mildly Agile and call themselves that. Um, I think there's also some working out of what it means because finance and HR are the two departments that are most strictly controlled by regulation, right? Unless unless you're talking about some of your process, some industries are heavily also, but anything that involves money or people's financial data or their personal data is going to be very controlled. And so figuring out how to use agility and transparency at the same time that you have to follow multiple legislatures and multiple rules, because the minute you go outside of one country, you're now juggling multiple baskets puts a limit on it. But I think that all of the HR people that I have spoken to absolutely love this idea, want to embrace this, want to figure out how to, to, to get people going because it's so much easier to recruit when you have a good culture. It's so much easier when the employees are saying, come on board, this is a great place to work, right? And I think that there's about the balance that you're sensing there is between how do we follow the rules and procedures versus, you know, how do we stay open? How do we follow laws about what we can and cannot do in hiring and, and maintaining? And how do we keep people in an open environment where they, they feel they can make a difference? Sure. JJ? Yeah. Given the, you know, when I, I talked to a number of our customers, um, Bobby, one, you were at a financial services firm. Uh, John Deere has has done this as a large customer of ours. Uh, it's 
So a couple of years ago, this really big bank, like one of the biggest banks on the planet, uh, called me up for some help. And I actually asked them, you know, they have trillions of dollars under management. And I said, why are you calling? You have the money. And they said, because no one wants to work for us. And we know that if we don't have a different culture, if we don't have a great place to work, we're not going to get the talent that we need. Right. And I see this over and over in you know, our customers globally. Uh, one of our customers uh, in the UK, they're, they're really saying we need to attract and retain the best talent because if we don't, we're not competitive. And I hear that. Over and over and over. And Bobby, you can talk about the financial services firm that you're working with uh, that really stressed this. Yeah, it, because oftentimes what we're finding and more and more companies are recognizing this is that they're not competing against other financial firms for their people. They're competing against everybody, including you know a lot of these places, you know, the little startups and little gaming companies. And there's generations of people who have heard about the what it's like to work in large healthcare or large finance and they're thinking to myself why would i ever go there when i can go to all these other places who have more of what you refer to as an agile culture and so it does it does become a they have to pay more in order to bring those people in and so the actual cost behind not having an agile culture is much greater than an organization that does and there are real costs associated with that Right. And I think one of the things we're touching on, we haven't stated explicitly, and it needs to be said explicitly, is most of these big older companies were built by people who were boomers, and then to some degree, some Generation X. And a lot of the workers now are Generation X, Generation Z, and then the millennials in between, right? And their expectations generationally are different. Now, there are people who aren't in that generation who will absolutely resonate with it one way or the other. So it's not as simple as that. But if you take it from a broad brush level, there are expectations of the way people work, of the way they function. People who grew up with social media and with mobile devices have a very different sort of idea than people who, when they started their career, there was no such thing, right? And there are companies that have just gotten comfortable and set in their ways. This is exactly what Bobby's saying about an agile culture, you know, and, and a lot of times HR is the group leading the, the push for change because they're at the front lines of having to do those, those interviews of having to recruit. Right. And then ironically, how many companies lay off their recruiters in the first wave of people they get rid of, right. There, there's a message in there somewhere. And I think, you know, it's, it's scrum eight. Uh, that's actually where we start with our with our customers is looking at what are their business outcomes, but what is their culture because their culture drives those outcomes. And they can't get what they want without having a strong culture. And that's actually one of the places we really do start when we do a transformation. All right. For our final question, before we move to the question and answer period, I'm going to ask each of you the same question. And it is, as a former journalist, this is one of my all-time favorite questions. JJ, I'm going to start with you. We've talked about a bunch of different trends to stay competitive in 2023. What is your top trend, trend that we have not discussed? Well, I think we've addressed it, but I just think it bears emphasizing, which is, as Bobby and Joyce have pointed out, the world is in constant change. We learned this during the pandemic. We're learning it now. We'll learn it next year. And what companies need, really need to be able to do is to pivot, to change, to focus. And that's true no matter what environment. And as we've learned over the past you know, few years, dramatically, the ones who are able to adjust quickly, who are able to change what they were doing, to uh, you know, deal with remote work, to deal with different cultures, to deal with you know, uh, you know, the supply chain issues we talked about, and all this disruption. This is just more disruption. So, as people have learned over the past few years, change is always going to happen, and it's actually going to happen faster. So you have to get your organization able to not deal with change, but to embrace change, mm -hmm. to not be afraid of it. But to realize that is the world we live in. And so we have to be able to do that. 
Joyce, I'm going to come to you next. What is the top trend of 2023 that we have not discussed yet, in your opinion? Diversity. Mm. There are ample, ample studies that say that diverse organizations and diverse cultures are able to thrive better because you have people who are not all, hey, we're all thinking the same way. We're all singing from the same playbook. We have that difference. And diversity as a metric and a statistic is a dangerous thing to do because you can make it look good on paper, but it's not actually really there. And so how do we lean into diversity when sometimes that feels like the scariest thing to do? That's a great And point. then the second thing I would say is the other thing I would say is everybody on this call, everybody listening, ask yourself, what can I do to myself, to my approach to work, to, to how I interact to become more agile? Where am I stuck? Where am I making assumptions? That's kind of an interesting question to, to leave with yourself there. Absolutely. Bobby, your turn. Joyce is all up in my head. Uh, I, I, was, <laughs> I was thinking diversity as well. Uh, I wrote a blog 10 years ago that was called How Cultural Diversity Enhances Agility. And oh, it's even more so in play today than it was 10 years ago. And I, I think that is a huge point that companies have to, to really lean in. But at the same time, uh, going in, in just a slightly different direction, organizations have to understand it takes change to be good at change. And so being able, and it kind of leans into a little bit what JJ was saying, being able to get good at the concept of change. How do we change internally, embrace that concept becomes important for us to be able to, as an organization, learn how to change. And th this goes from the individual, and, and you might be thinking in terms of change management concepts, and there's lots of different ways to do that. But as you adjust as an organization to become more adaptable, there are ways for the person, for the team, for the program, for, the, for leadership to become good at change. And so I, I think that's just gonna become more and more apparent as we go forward. And right. Tom, if, oh, if I can, Tom, if I can just say one more thing on the point of diversity, there's diversity of diversity here too. It can be diversity of who's involved. It can be diversity of where they come from. It can be diversity of experience. It can be diversity of anything you want to measure on a demographic scale. D -d diversity just means someone who's not going to act the same way I am necessarily. That's 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 all it means is don't surround yourself by people who have the same experience, the same outlook, the same whatever. But but yes, that, that's a big diversity, not a little one. Yeah. Understood. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to questions panel. Uh, and the first question I'd like to get an answer to or get your thoughts on is from Lucian. And his question is about, um, it goes right back to the beginning of what we were talking about with aligning to business objectives. And it, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just read his question. With many teams focusing on velocity, as an important metric and few teams understanding how that translates into business value, what are some methods you have seen work in translating velocity into business value? Well, velocity, you know, by this definition is speed in a direction. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, that's one of my little hobby horses, but <clears throat> velocity is really good as a planning metric for the team. It's not great as a, as a performance metric. And so, you know, conflating those two things, because velocity says to a team, this is how much work we can get done in X period of time, right? Because we know we want to get that better. It doesn't say at all, are we delivering the value? So uh, the product on a role and accountability in Scrum is to make sure that what the team is working on is the most valuable. And they need to have very clear metrics on how they measure that and how they align with the goals. The, the team and the Scrum Master are, you know, the, the Scrum Master accountability is how do we get faster? What's getting in our way? How do we deliver with quality? What the product owner is prioritizing. But it's really getting a really clear idea of what are the metrics that the product owner is prioritizing by. But velocity itself is just a planning metric, not a performance metric. 
So on a similar vein, another question we have, this one from Juan is, how can we align the strategy to the day-to-day -day operations? Specifically, they're wondering about some kind of metrics framework, OKRs or the EBM. What, and Joyce, actually, I'll throw this one to you because I know that, that you've done a lot with that on the, the State of Agile report. What is the trend that you're seeing in the industry? Right. So, so a lot of folks, we, we actually asked them, I'm trying to pull up the report here and I've lost it on my, uh, so this, if you go into the report, the exact statistics are there, but we saw that people were breaking it out into sort of three layers and, and the worst examples were the IT metrics. Those, those really aren't going to help you. Those are good metrics sometimes. Um, OKRs, KPIs, those kinds of metrics are things that I think people are really starting to, to lean into more. And then um, customer satisfaction, um, project outcomes, business project outcomes. Those are the kinds of things. But you, know, you begin with the end in mind. What are we trying to do, right? The product, the product owner is trying to build to something. How do we know we're making a difference? What will we, you know, one of the questions you can ask is what does success look like? Does success mean more people are buying? Does it mean people are buying more of? Does it mean they're buying a greater percentage of our portfolio? We're expanding our footprint. What does success look like? And then do you have a way to measure the thing you do is actually driving that? All right. JJ, I'm going to throw this next question to you. And I, this is one that we've seen a lot of uh, questions, similar questions in the, the Q&A. When it comes to trying to align to business objectives, what if senior leadership is not sharing this information? They're not telling their people where they're going. They are just telling you what you think you need to know or what they think you need to know, that limited view. What is your advice to those organizations or what are they setting themselves up for? Failure. Um, yeah. but... <laughs> Not to but, put two points on a point. The, on, the, yeah. the, the key really is figuring out if if you know you're not in leadership, you don't have a lot of access to leadership, figure out how they're being judged. What are they being held accountable for? Their personal currency. It, their personal currency. What what is the thing that's going to get them what they want? And then how does your work tie into that? The other piece is figuring out, <clears throat> don't just worry about your piece. In the value stream like okay like you see this all the time okay i'm an engineer my engineering stuff is done i toss it over while well, those people in marketing aren't doing their job it's like the no value is created until it actually is in a customer hand so even if you're on an internal thing how is what you're doing adding to customer value and that's usually pretty easy to measure in most companies how are customers responding, whether it's sales, whether it's NPS, whether, you know, whatever, there are a bunch of different ways depending on what you're doing. But how uh, is your company measuring customer value? Then you can say, okay, how is what I'm doing driving that? Right. Uh, this next question, I'm, Bobby, I'm gonna throw this to you first, but I'd love to hear JJ what you think and Joyce as well. How do you improve retention, employee retention in a time of crisis? That's a great question. We are literally just in the process of writing up some information on this. And so it's it's also very timely because companies, quite frankly, are looking for ways to be able to retain, like we were talking about earlier, some of those really important key people. And so part of it is understanding the people and what they're having to go through now, not to get overly personal about it, but what's going on with the teams, what's going on with our leadership, what can we do to try to improve the situation? It's about continuous improvement. Improve the situation that they're in and so, so that staying here seems like the most viable option for them currently. Now, there are other options out there. We've talked about that. We're, we're in a war for talent. And so when we're showing we're adjusting our culture, when we're doing more things that are pinpointed and directed towards the people side of this, understanding the people and making the environment better, allowing for more specific things like remote work and helping people with those environments. And the more that we're putting our effort towards them, the more likely they are to stay with us. People don't leave companies, they leave leadership. I just add to that. I, 
I think Bobby is completely correct. And that's, you know, focusing on your people and finding out, you know, how to make their lives better. But also one of the big motivators of human beings is meaningful work. And this sort of ties back to the last question. <clears throat> Why are you doing what you're doing? What is the meaning? What is the impact of what you're doing? If you don't allow people to do meaningful work, if they're just, you know, playing with an Excel spreadsheet and they don't know why, what is the impact of what they're doing? They'll leave because people want to have meaning in their lives. Part of my day job is external communications and I work with the internal comms people. You cannot over communicate enough. When environments get tense, people start to worry. They start to be afraid. When there is silence, they read their fear into the silence. Um, we've had a couple of changes at our company internally recently that were good. And they had a couple of sudden all hands meetings where the title was, you know, all hands meeting, don't worry, good news, right? Because people saw in all hands, they went, oh my goodness, what is this? And, and everybody, and we were sensitive to the fact that by doing something like that, it would trigger people's fear. So what do you communicate? How do you communicate it? How often do you communicate it? You can communicate that there are challenging things going on, but in a way that is supportive, right? So, so that it does, as JJ said, give people a sense of meaning. Hey, you're all part of what's going to get us through this hard time, right? You know, as Bobby said, um, making sure you, you really understand what's motivating the people, right? People want to do well in their companies. They want to feel like they're part of it. They want to have meaningful work. And so how do you communicate with your team? Hey, I think we're seeing some change in priority. So we're going to focus here, right? Communication can never, ever, ever be overvalued. I agree, hundred percent. I want to go now. I want to build off this idea of change that we're talking about here. And there's a number of comments, a number of questions that really push this idea of some organizations just aren't willing to change, especially in unpredictable times. They really fight it because they're afraid of the risk, or they're afraid of the change even more than the outcome of not changing. We've talked about this a lot, so. Imagine that you are a scrum master or a product owner, someone talking to middle management. How do you convince them? How do you push them? You're not going to get them to go from no to yes. It's not a binary. But how do you get them moving in the right direction so that change is no longer an A, B, and we're scared of A, but you can start pushing them from B to A? Transparency. <laughs> let's let's start with Joyce, Bobby. You had... you. Go Please. ahead, Joyce. Ask them questions. Instead of having an answer, have a bunch of questions. And these questions can be leading questions, folks, right? But ask them questions. Um, we had a situation um, the other day where in a, in a housing development where some people wanted cameras and others didn't. And, and there were very strong security issues on both sides. And so instead of arguing on both sides, the question became, what do you need to feel secure? What is security? And when people could talk about that, then the idea of what to do became a little easier. So when we go to the manager, this has to change. You're pushing up against somebody. But if you start to say, you start to ask questions, how is this working? What is the response? To then you start to open up to allowing new information, different points of view, right? But ask questions. All right, so we have I ask just bring up Blockbuster a lot. That's what I would do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Fear. indeed. Or Blockbuster. Um, uh, JJ, I'm going to throw the last question to you, but Bobby, I want you, you obviously wanted to answer that, that question as well. So, yeah, I think one of the things I've seen most <clears throat> successful in helping to change minds, especially with, from a uh, middle management perspective, is data. Go with data, make it very transparent, be real with, with what you're bringing to the table and say, here is what's actually taking place. And the data is hard to argue. And then kind of leaning into to what Joyce was talking about as well, asking some of those open-ended questions around getting their thoughts on what we could be doing to help solve some of these issues around change and so forth. But it's really hard to argue with the data when it's presented in front of them that we should be going in a certain direction. And that's part of the influence that a scrum master can bring to the table. So JJ, I told you we were going to get the last question, and this is a really good one. George, uh, I hope I'm saying that correctly, wrote, 
Do you think that Agile has been confined too much to the tactical components and not enough at the strategic level? I would say that there is a lot of Agile out there that is totally team-based, that is at um, that level. Mm -hmm. And that's great. There are some really great teams out there. But the Agile organizations, like that's what we try to do with, at Scrum Inc, is really say, how do we get the enterprise Agile? How do we allow the enterprise to react? Because it is a whole ecosystem. And I think that one of the things in some companies is, you know, people have this thing about middle management or about leadership from the Agile perspective. Well, they have a role, in some ways, the most important role, which is they need to decide the direction of the company. And so to do that, we try to build in enterprise agility, not just, okay, there's a bunch of engineers down in the basement who are cranking out stuff. It needs to be, what is the enterprise world? How does the enterprise as a whole do it? And I actually think, you know, our customers, that's a lot of how we're interacting now. We're definitely interacting with leadership and with uh, management because they are smart people. They are trying, they have clear goals, a lot of them, or they're lost in the woods and they've got to figure it out. But until they can do that at the leadership level, it doesn't matter how good their scrum teams are. It just doesn't. And I think that more and more companies, yeah, that's why they're coming to us. More and more companies are saying, how do we get the whole enterprise to be agile? Because that's what we need now. I think that there is, has been over the past few, uh, I'd say, five years, maybe, uh, a real shift in that attitude from the leadership level. Yeah. Well, we are at our time box. I'm sorry to say there are a ton more great questions in truly fantastic questions. Thank you all for submitting them. And uh, we will do our best to uh, make sure that everybody gets a prompt email once we get this webinar published. Again, it is recorded, so we are going to post it for on-demand replay. And I want to thank now everybody who is here, our panelists. Uh, Bobby, you are a principal consultant at Scrum Inc. And thank you very much for your insights. Uh, Joyce, you are our sure. guest in this house today. Uh, you were obviously with Digital AI. Thank you so much for bringing your insights as well. And JJ is a best-selling author who, as you heard, is now working on an updated version of the what we lovingly refer to as the Red Book, the original book that kind of introduced Scrum to the world. JJ, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. And thanks for joining us, Joyce. It's been great. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, Jens. I want to thank you very much for being here. I want to thank all of the team members that you don't see behind me now doing all the great work. So thank you to everyone here who has helped take part and uh, make sure you join us for our next webinar. Take care, everyone.